happy. <laughs> and what's the word? Here we go. This joyful beast comes high over the sea of song. My love of crucified, I must run to life is gone. And Christ that once was slain, let us be free. It's a very leafy based part, yes. occasionally, if I remember, but have noticed a bit more rustling of papers of of late. <laughs> who's, who's singing on Thursday, John? Oh, I'm singing. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> I'm Oliver on Thursday. Laura, good. Well
All together now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Peter's. It's really cheering to see you. It's been lovely just uh, catching coming some of you as you come in. I feel much better for it. And uh, yeah, it's a bit cold outside, but it's lovely to be in your company as we gather for worship this morning. Uh, my name is Alan Garrow. I am the vicar here. If you're joining us online, then a particular welcome to you. It's really good to have had your company, especially if you've been coming uh, week on week uh, uh, because you're, you're, you're staying at home at the moment. We're really glad to be able to share in worship with you. Hannah Beck will be preaching today on John 15, Jesus the Vine, and so we'll be reflecting on and enjoying our sense of connectedness to one another in Jesus. If you're a newcomer amongst us, I'm just kind of looking, I don't think that's true of anybody here, um, but we do have welcome cards and it'd be great to get to know you afterwards. And if you're online, do be in touch with us. We'd love to give you a personal welcome. Um, let me think, things are coming out. Your weekly news is available in hard copy here and also online on the website. Christian Aid Week starts next uh, Sunday and we'll have a, a speaker coming from Summerbridge to address that subject and then Christian Aid Week goes through that week. Towards the end of this month, there's the annual parochial church meeting and there'll be information and papers relating to that available online and uh, in the weekly news and at the welcome desk as the month goes through. Our opportunities to stand for Deanery Synod and also for the Parochial Church Council coming up then. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about just the connectedness of our church life and how many people are involved in making things all work together. And by my calculations, well, this one's pretty sound, before lockdown, it was about 180 people were required to enable the whole of St. Peter's life to happen, which is a massive proportion of the total uh, members of the, con of, of the community. Uh, in, as we are now, I think we're probably down to about 90 people. And so as we look to open up again uh, from the beginning of July, then there's quite a lot of spaces that will need filling uh, to enable all those things which we used to do uh, to do again. Well, obviously, we'll, we'll see what's possible and maybe there'll be new things as well. But uh, one of the things which is fantastic about this church is how, how many people have given uh, a little bit to create the whole. And of course, some people uh, have worked tremendously hard in the past and given a great deal of themselves in the past and are no longer able to do that. We're really grateful for that service and also uh, for your prayers for us as we continue on into this new phase of our life. Um, I was online with my clergy colleagues recently this week and we're talking about what, what people are doing about singing, for example. What do we expect to be able to do about singing from July? And the impression I was getting was that there's quite a lot of caution about that that even though restrictions will, kind of legal restrictions are due to come to an end at that point, if things go according to plan, that dis distancing and face covering and singing or not singing might still be part of the picture. This is a bit of a non-notice, really. It's a way of saying, we don't know what's going to happen. I think what you can be sure of here is that we will have as much as we can do as soon as we can within the safe boundaries. That will be our goal. We won't be holding back about that. But we also recognize that we need to take care of each other. And especially in these days, it's hard, isn't it? When you're looking forward to something getting easier, to not to jump the gun. So if we can uh, uh, maintain those uh, things which we do to take care of one another, especially when we're in the building, better to talk outside, then let's do that. A lot of notices. And so uh, let's focus now on what we're here to do, which is to worship Almighty God. And we stand as our marvellous choir lead us in singing at the Lamb's High Feast. We sing, but 
but we don't sing, okay? Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, so that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now Elizabeth is going to read our lesson from Acts.
The first reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 26. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading. In before the gospel, the Son of God proclaimed.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the gospel of Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit down. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine grower. And again, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Now, I don't know much about vine growing. I don't, my, so my grandparents grew, had a vine growing up the back of the house. My sister-in-law had the, a vine growing at the front of her house, that was in London. They didn't do much to them. They didn't get much grapes. But I've seen vines growing with John. John decided he liked river cruises. River cruises don't make you seasick. So we went on several river cruises together. And there on the sides of the Rhine, the sides of the Rhone, you see vines growing in, in profundity. Masses of them all along, like long strings, one below the other on the terraces. Apparently vines grow better at the bottom of a, ter of, of, of a hill, which is why they make terraces to catch the good soil that grows down the hill. You need a hill to get the sun, apparently. But I don't know much, so I Googled it. Because the people of Jesus' time would have known masses about it. Jesus was talking to people who knew about how to grow vines, not just like me. Because in Jesus' time, wine was the best thing to drink. You didn't drink water if you could help it too much. Water wasn't guaranteed to be pure. Wine is good against infections. We know we've got lots of alcohol all around this church so that you can clean your hands and make sure you don't get COVID. So while alcohol is good against infections. So they drank more alcohol than they did water. So they knew how to grow vines. Google it. What does it say? Grape vines, whether grown for dessert or wine and indoors or outdoors, need regular pruning and training to keep them under control and produce good fruit yields. The main pruning time is early winter, November or December. If you prune later, this can cause the sap to bleed and weaken the plant. Training and printing out new shoots, as well as thinning of the fruits, is carried out in spring and summer. No matter where you grow your grapevines, you will need to put up some sort of support system. That's not a bad thing for life, is it? Pruning in, in, the, in the New Testament, apparently, the Greek word for pruning, here used it in John's Gospel, is also the word for cleansing. We all need cleansing. Get rid of the bad things in us as often as possible, please. Training, being taught where we should go been trained along, along the wires, usually wires, tra and also thinning out 
so you're not trying to do too much. All ideal things, for me, probably more than most, but never mind that. So whatever, and then support system. You've got to have a support system. What, um, vines apparently, I don't know if this is still true, but looking up um, farming in the time of Christ, apparently they were all grown from shoots. So the grape seeds you have in us in our grapes apparently aren't used to grow vines. Or well, they weren't. Things may have changed nowadays. You put your little shoot in the ground, like you do a bit of a geranium cutting. Let it grow, tend it carefully, water it, feed it, leave it for three years, and then start to train it, prune it, cut it back. Never neglect your vine, always care for it. Now, we're in good hands. We need a good crop, but who's our vine grower? That the Lord, our God, is our vine grower, the Father, as Jesus calls him. Who, who is the, what is our vine we're all growing on? The vine is Jesus. And we're all branches. And we need to be pruned, trained, and pinched out. Painful? Probably. The only way we're going to get a good crop but we're all branches on the same vine. We've got to work together. If we don't work together, it can't work. You can't have a branch sticking out, not getting attached to anything. You can't have some branches belonging, saying we, we, we're part of the vine, you're not. We're all part of the same vine. Some will be main branches, some will be twigs. Some will be the ones that have the, and it's the end bits that very often have the grapes on them, isn't it? not the main thick stems. At St. Peter's, as Alan's already told us, and Tony also used to tell us, we have a lot of volunteers. We have one of the highest percentages of volunteers in a church, of any church, and we have a lot of members. But suddenly, we were asked to stop. We weren't just asked to stop, we were told we couldn't go on. For most people, this last year has been a year when we couldn't grow grapes for our Lord. Not in the way we thought we could, not in the way we were used to doing it, not ringing bells, singing in the choir, not um, helping with Sunday school, taking part in weekly service, weekday service, weekly, weekly service and weekday services, no more refreshment days. All the things we thought we could do for God were stopped. Even, even John was only allowed to play the organ occasionally to make sure it was still working. Because I always asked him to play a tune and he said he wasn't allowed to against the rules. So we've, everything stopped. So all the branches were just stopped. It was as if they'd gone into winter. Time for pruning, time for hibernation. No sap. I was very, very lucky that what I did was considered by a lot of people to be essential certainly by the people we feed and i was allowed to, and people kept giving us food kept giving us meals kept, and that we had a very small nucleus of people who were able to keep going and normally we have 30 people helping in breakfast club i think at one stage we went down to about six plus the clergy without the clergy i don't think we could have done it without the people who brought us in meals, without the people who went collecting food from their neighbors. One boy scout went and collected masses of food. It all came. Somebody else was collecting food from, for the Duke of Edinburgh's award. Masses coming again. We had, suddenly we got thousands of bottles of water from the Nightingale Hospital. It all got used up, but we got food. It all came and we started doing more meals because Betty's gave us food that had to be eaten hot. So we couldn't give it to them cold. We had to heat it and give them a hot meal. And suddenly we were doing hot meals as well in the evening as well as breakfast. The first couple of months we did 2000 meals. Most all after the beginning, all takeaways. Now we're back inside. Now we've got a bigger nucleus. Now many of you are soon going to get the opportunity to be back producing grapes. You might find that since you've been locked down, you find new ways of producing grapes, new fruits, different flavors. You helped your neighbors. 
You found things that were desperately needed to serve the Lord. Serve him in serving his people. Serve Christ in others. But we need to find so much, as Alan said at the beginning, we need to look to the Lord and ask, where do I fit onto this vine? Maybe we need to become twigs again. Maybe we need to start as a fresh shoot and not be the old strong, strong branch we were. There may be a new root for us, but we need people and we need lots of them. If we're going to get open again, do the weekday services again, sell churches, all the house groups, all the many, many things that were going on. We're certainly going to need a lot more for Breakfast Club because the people we had at the beginning, some of them can't come back. Some of them have come back. Some of them will come back eventually. Some we've got some new people. We're going to need more. At the moment we've got about 30. We probably need, if we don't have the clergy at every single time, which has been wonderful, we'll probably need to make up for two clergy. That means we need another 10 people. Okay, two clergy equal 10 people. So we need more. But we all need, the thing we haven't talked about much so far is support. Vines need support. And support comes in most extraordinary places. We get support from reading God's word. We get support from reading the Bible. We get support and understanding when it's explained to us. But sometimes you can read things and think you're never ever going to get the support you need. Years and years ago, I think it's 60 years ago, somebody told me about, we were learning about the Synoptic Gospels. And I was told that there was, Mark was written first, then Luke, I was definitely told Luke came next, and then Matthew. Mark was used to write at Matthew, Mark, Luke and Matthew, but Luke and Matthew had another source as well called Q. How I longed to find out what this Q was. And it's something I've thought about a lot over the years, but assumed that I'd never find out because 60 years later, no, 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 that's, that's exaggerated now. 55 years later, I still didn't know. And then when I did A-level scripture, or religious, religious knowledge, I think it was called, we learned about the Acts of the Apostles, and they got to the Acts 15, this fantastic conference they had, the Council of Jerusalem, and everyone got together. And at the end of it, they just sent out a very small thing. No, that doesn't make sense. At the end of a big thing like the Council of Jerusalem, they just sent out a big document to everybody, not just telling them not to eat, that you don't have to get circumcised, and you, don't, you can't eat food given to idols. It's been bothering me for all these years, this has. And then we got a new vicar. Do you remember we got a new vicar? And shortly after he came, he was speaking at the Harrogate School of Theology. And we all went to listen to him, not because we were interested, because we wanted to know what he was like. Fantastic turnout. And we got cheap rates if we came from St. Peter's. We all, not all, but I expect lots of you went. I certainly went expecting to find out about this new vicar. To my amazement, he was a Philip moment. Philip, who told the eunuch what happened, what it meant. He suddenly explained to me, Hugh, and what came out of Acts 15. Alan is probably about the only person in the world, I think, that really knows the answers. And we got him as a vicar. So that's how God sent me, my Philip, to explain to me the questions that I thought I'd never find out till I was dead. So look out for where the support's coming from. There is the support there. It'll come when you least expect it. But we must read the Bible and we must be open to where support comes. But we need to be the vine branches. We need to find out where we're needed and we need to work together. So please God, this will be a vine where God can work in us and we can work in him. This is God's church. This is the Christ church of Christ, our vine. Please Lord, may we be good and fruitful branches. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, grant that your church, constant in faith and love, may bring forth good fruit. Father, nurture us as branches of the true vine. Train and prune us where necessary, and may our spiritual harvest make rich wine. Help us to understand that through, though there are many branches, we all stem from the one vine, the true vine, our Saviour. Lord, help us to see that sometimes certain structures in our lives are in reality dead wood, and that there can be no renewal without clearing out all that is decayed. Help us to be bold in our spring cleaning so that new life may burst into being in your name. Lord, we give you thanks for the recovery we experience from the coronavirus. We thank you for the freedom we enjoy coming out of lockdown. We pray for those who still experience considerable restrictions on their freedom of movement and ability to see loved ones. We pray for those in care homes and those who have families abroad. Lord, in this election week, we pray for all those who will hope to take up positions of responsibility. We ask that you give them strength, wisdom, integrity and courage so that they may carry out their duties in the best interests of all people and in accordance with your will. Lord, we pray for those who are in pain, whether of the mind, body or spirit. We pray for the people in India. We are overwhelmed when confronted with images of people dying in ambulances and in the arms of loved ones pleading for oxygen. The sheer number of infections and deaths is difficult to take in. Paul tells us to mourn with those who mourn. In prayer, we express our solidarity with the people of India and those who have family in India and are distressed over their fate. May we keep them in our prayers and support the cause of contributions to solving this health emergency through our donations. Lord, we pray for the families of those who died in the Mount Meron religious festival in Israel. The 45 men and young boys were crushed to death. We pray for your comfort in their grief, which has been compounded by not being able to bury their loved ones before Sabbath. Father, we know that death cannot separate us from your love. In that knowledge, we commend to your keeping those who have died and all who miss them. Lord, we thank you that we can live in the joyful freedom of your love as we dedicate ourselves to serving others. Let us say grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to your almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. 
For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we, Lord, and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. 
Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee. And grant that we receive in these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee. And feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for thee, and be thankful.
Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee, for that thou, that thou dost felt safe to feed us, who have duly received these holy mysteries, with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ and dost assure us thereby of thy favour and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom by the merits of the most precious death and passion of thy dear Son. And we most humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Glory be to God. 
So now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our concluding hymn, Lights Abode, Celestial Silence. <laughs>